give you six principles regarding deliverance with corresponding scripture. And you can just jot these down on that piece of paper or wherever you're, you're making your notes. The New Testament and the Gospels in particular are full of accounts of deliverance where Jesus or the disciples were casting demons out of folks. And here's some principles that can be surmised from those accounts. Well, first of all, let me back way up. You have to believe there's a supernatural realm. If you don't believe there's a supernatural realm, this conversation's not going to mean anything to you. And if you believe that Jesus and God is real and he uses angels, the Bible also tells us that there's a hell and Satan and there's a hierarchy, powers and principalities and rulers. There is a hierarchy and a structure to both God's kingdom and Satan's kingdom. So these are very real entities. And, and for right now, this might be for people who are very logical and concrete and need um, data to support everything. Sorry, I don't have it for you. So you can either just kind of turn off the button and not listen or try to hear with your spiritual ears and eyes. So Lord, I just pray right now that you would open spiritual ears, spiritual eyes, and hearts to not necessarily just embrace, but to contemplate, to wrestle with, to examine and to seek you for understanding of these issues. Lord, continue to prepare us as a people for your glory and your precious name. Amen. Okay, first of all, first foundation. Don't mess with what you don't know. Acts 19, 11 to 20. You know these scriptures, but I'm going to read it to you. And I want you to listen about the demonic encounters. God gave Paul the power to perform unusual miracles. When handkerchiefs or aprons that had merely touched his skin were placed on sick people, they were healed of their diseases and evil spirits were expelled. So a group of Jews were traveling from town to town casting out evil spirits. They tried to use the name of the Lord in their incantation saying, I command you in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a leading priest, were doing this. But one time when they tried it, the evil spirit spoke to them and said, I know Jesus, and I know Paul, but who are you? <laughs> and then the man with the evil spirit leaped on them, overpowered them, and attacked them with such violence that they fled from the house naked and battered. There is a supernatural strength that does accompany demonic power. The story of what happened spread quickly through all Ephesus, to Jews and Greeks alike, a solemn fear descended on the city, and the name of the Lord Jesus was greatly honored. Many who became believers confessed their sinful practices. A number of them who had been practicing sorcery brought their incantation books and burned them at a public bonfire. The value of the books was several million dollars. So the message about the Lord spread widely and had a powerful effect. It doesn't take you too many times to encounter something demonic and supernatural before you, it kind of bypasses the logic to the intellect. And you say, what the heck was that? And by the, for the record, it says people started believing and they started repenting and bringing their sorcery and all the witchcraft stuff and burning them. The Bible is clear that if you have any of these things, they're supposed to pass through the fire. It's how you destroy them. You don't take them to the Salvation Army. You don't put them in your garbage. You don't give them to your neighbor. You burn them. Anything that can be burned should be burned, biblically, if it's not of God, if God's convicting you about it. This is what God's showing you. Now don't go home and say, Nancy's telling us to burn her books. God will show you if there are things in your home that don't belong there. Second concept. Some deliverance will require prayer and fasting. You're not just going to walk up to somebody on the street and take authority, because some of this stuff's really strong. Uh, Matthew 17, 14 to 21. And when they come to the multitude, a man came to him, kneeled down to him and said, Lord, would you have mercy on my son? For he's an epileptic and he suffers severely. For he often falls into the fire and often into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they couldn't cure him. And then Jesus answered them and said, oh, you faithless and perverse generation. How long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. 
And Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of him and the child was cured from that very hour. And then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, how oh, come we couldn't do that? And Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief. For assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say this mountain, move from here to there and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you. However, this kind doesn't go out except by prayer and fasting. There's some types of spirits that are going to require much more effort. And I don't know how many of you are willing or have in the past given up days of food or given up something that hurt you because you're praying for somebody else and you want to see somebody else free. There was a time several years ago the Lord said, I want you to fast for 10 days uh, and I'm going to show up on the eighth day. That made no sense to me. I didn't even know what he was going to do. But I did it, and I didn't even know what was going to happen on the eighth day. Until weeks later, I found out there was a young man that I had been uh, ministering to who happened to be a Satanist. And he liked me for some reason. But during the 10 days I was pr praying and fasting, on day eight, he accepted Jesus. And I didn't know about it until weeks after. You don't even get to know sometimes. When God says do it, you do it. Number three, we are cautioned against directly engaging with, accusing, or rebuking demons. I know a lot of people have a lot of opinions on this. We are cautioned against directly engaging with, accusing or rebuking demons. I'm going to tell you what the Lord's told me. He said, I'll let you see it. I'm going to train you. You're going to be able to smell him coming a mile off. But you don't even worry about that. You just keep focusing on me. You just keep speaking Jesus to people. You keep declaring the word of the Lord. You, you confront when it needs to be confronted. Shut it down. Don't let it have a, a voice. He said, but I'll take care of that. I'm to see it. And I'm not necessarily to confront it. Even if somebody comes to me and says that the t ways I've been used in deliverance are by building relationship and doing exactly what I've told you, getting to heart issues. And God will remove it according to his plans and his timing. And it's been very profound and radical. You heard three of them last week talk about their story. I wasn't standing over anybody yelling, come out. <coughs> It was just speaking the word of God, speaking who God had called them to be, telling them truth, loving them, and they had a radical encounter with the Lord. So in Jude 9, 11, it says, Even Michael, one of the mightiest of the angels, did not dare accuse the devil of blasphemy, but he simply said, The Lord rebukes you. This took place when Michael was arguing with the devil about Moses' body. Now, if you know anything about the book of Jude, he's telling the church, be careful, there are people coming in amongst you that are wolves in sheep's clothing. And they say they're one thing and they're not, and they're saying they're Christians and they're prophets, but they're not. And so he goes on in verse 10 and says, these people scoff at things they don't understand. They're like unthinking animals. They do whatever their instincts tell them, and they bring about their own destruction. So he's saying, don't be rebuking demons and devils. You're, you're dealing with things you don't understand, and by doing so, you're going to bring about your own destruction. The next one. This is interesting. Even the unsaved can cast out demons in Jesus' name. Matthew 7, 21 to 23. Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father will enter. And on Judgment Day, many are going to come to me and say, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name. We cast out demons in your name. We performed many miracles in your name, but I will say, I never knew you. Get away from me. There will be people casting out demons who aren't going to heaven, and they're going to do it in Jesus' name. The next principle, very important. Demonic spirits can return and will return even after deliverance. 
Matthew 12, 43 to 45. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through the dry places seeking rest and finds none. And then he says, well, I'm just going to go back to my house from where I came. And when he comes, he found that the house has been all swept clean. It's empty and it's put in order. And then he goes and he takes with him seven other spirits more wicked and powerful than himself. And they enter and dwell there in that man. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. So shall it also be with this wicked generation. This is, a, this is the portion of scripture I use when people say, Oh, I'd like God to deliver me. I'd like to be set free. Do you really? Have you counted the cost? Because if you aren't going to intentionally chase after Jesus, nobody's doing you any favors by walking you through a deliverance process. If God sets you free, you better be prepared to maintain that house. And you've got to be so filled with the Holy Spirit that when that spirit goes out, he comes back because he will come back. I've heard this, and Gary and I were just talking about this the other day. He said, once somebody gets delivered, they're going to get tested again because that thing's going to come back with a vengeance and see if it can get back in. And God's going to teach you how to stand. He's going to teach you how to get strong. He's going to teach you about how the enemy works. And the last premise or concept that is very important to me and the Lord gave to me. Don't mock what is holy. Matthew 7, 6. In the New Living it says, Don't waste what is holy on people who are unholy. Don't throw your pearls to the pigs. Because they'll just trample them in the mud and then turn on you and attack you. I don't need to convince you folks of this. I've had more people ridicule and, and blow me off and it's not I don't need to convince you I'm doing this because God said I want you to teach on this uh, there are depths of the spiritual realm that people are not aware of because number one it scares them it's not logical their mind can't wrap around it um, God will show you as much as he, you want to know and I can quickly tell if somebody really doesn't care, and I've learned to not cast my pearls before swine. Because I don't need to convince anybody, and I'm not going to let you mock and ridicule what's very holy. So when we're doing a deliverance ministry here, somebody falls on the ground, or you hear somebody shriek, or somebody vomit, I better not hear any laughing and teeheeing and twittering. It's one thing to talk in kindness and be able to chuckle over things that we're learning together, um, but to mock and ridicule. God doesn't like that, and I'm not going to allow it here either.